Hello, and welcome to another PNP Live. My name is Bashan. I am part of the event staff at Politics and Pros. I want to thank everyone for joining us at our event today. Uh, before we do get started, there are a couple items I want to go over. The first is that if anyone has any questions they would like to ask of any of our authors, uh, we would ask for you to place it into the Q&A box, which you can find uh, if you move your cursor around towards the bottom of your screen. Um, separately from that, uh, at any time during the event, you can go to the chat section where you'll be able to find <clears throat> links which will take you to the Politics and Pros website where you'll be able to purchase a copy of Except for Palestine uh, for, directly from the Politics and Pros website. We uh, highly encourage that and we thank you for your patronage. In this major work of daring criticism and analysis, scholar and political commentator Mark Lamont Hill and Israel-Palestine expert Mitchell Plitnik spotlight how holding fast to one-sided and unwaveringly pro-Israel policies reflects the truth-bending grip of authoritarianism on both Israel and the United States. Except for Palestine, deftly argues that progressives and liberals who oppose regressive policies on immigration, racial justice, gender equality, LGBTQ rights, and other issues must extend these core principles to the oppression of Palestinians. In doing so, the authors take seriously the political concerns and well being of both Israelis and Palestinians, demonstrating the extent to which US policy has made peace harder to attain. They also unravel the conflation of advocacy for Palestinian rights with anti Semitism and hatred of Israel in general. Mark Lamont Hill is an award winning journalist and the Steve Charles Professor of Media, Cities, and Solutions at Temple University. Prior to that, he held positions at Columbia University and Morehouse College. He is the author and co-author of multiple books, including the New York, New York Times bestselling Nobody. Dr. Hill holds a PhD with distinction from the University of Pennsylvania. His research agenda focuses on the intersections between culture, politics, and education in the United States and the Middle East. The co-author of this book, along with Mr. Hill, is Mitchell Plitnik. He is currently the president of Rethinking Foreign Policy, a political analyst, and a frequent writer on the Middle East and U.S. foreign policy. His past roles include vice president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace, founding director of the U.S. Office of Baselem, and co-director of Jewish Voice for Peace. And they are joined today by Ms. Michelle Alexander. Uh, Ms. Alexander is a highly acclaimed civil rights lawyer, advocate, legal scholar, and author of The New Jim Crow, which some of you may be familiar with. She is a former Ford Foundation Senior Fellow and Soros Justice Fellow. She has clerked for Supreme Court Justice Harry Blackman and has run the ACLU, Northern California's Racial Justice Project. Ms. Alexander is a visiting professor at Union Theological Seminary and an opinion columnist for the New York Times. Without any further ado, the floor is yours. Well, thank you for that introduction. I have to say, I am just thrilled to be here tonight and host this conversation when I received an advanced copy of the book along with the invitation to lead this dialogue. I think I just about leapt out of my chair after seeing the title and the authors. I thought, okay, this is a book I'm dying to read and I can't wait to discuss it with the two of them. And so I'm glad the moment um, has arrived. I have become deeply interested in the human rights crisis in Palestine in recent years. And I've learned from my own experience how many people are progressive except for Palestine and how brutal the backlash can be when you dare to criticize Israel by holding it to the same standards that we would hold any other nation. Um, I've been target of fierce criticism by so-called progressives for even questioning Zionism, for wondering aloud whether it can be squared with our commitments to racial and social justice and religious freedom. Uh, my own interest in Palestine began more than a decade ago, actually probably about 15 years ago when a friend of mine returned from a visit to Israel and Palestine and was deeply shaken. He told me that in his view, that what he saw in Palestine was apartheid, plain and simple, 
Uh, he then paused and said, no, actually what I saw in Palestine was worse than apartheid in South Africa. And when he said that, it shocked me because he's an African-American scholar and activist who'd been deeply involved in the movement to end apartheid in South Africa. And he'd spent a great deal of time there working with people in the most oppressive of conditions. And he's not prone to hyperbole. And I was stunned by some of the stories he shared. This was probably 15 years ago. And I remember making a mental note to learn more, to investigate myself, but I didn't back then. At the time, I was still working as a civil rights lawyer, representing victims of racial profiling and police violence, investigating the drug war. And I was consumed by the wars that were being waged by our government against our people. I started reading some articles about Israel, Palestine in you know, newspapers and magazines when I would stumble across them. And I asked some of my Jewish friends about their perspectives, but I never took the time to really read the books, to learn, to really immerse myself. Um, I thought I was too busy battling you know, <laughs> the US government on our own soil over the forms of oppression that were happening here. But then years later, I met Vincent Harding, a former speechwriter for Martin Luther King Jr., who's one of the lesser known heroes of the civil rights movement. He penned the Beyond Vietnam speech that King delivered at Riverside Church in which King you know, declared his opposition to the Vietnam War. And Vincent became a dear friend of mine, um, somewhat of a mentor. And I was shocked again when I learned that at 81 years of age and in failing health, he was determined to travel to Palestine. He believed that the struggles of the Palestinian people to be free and equal share much in common with the struggles um, for black freedom in the United States and with oppressed peoples around the world. And he was determined to make a pilgrimage to Palestine before he died. And he told me that the time was long overdue for me to bring an international lens to racial justice struggles and movements rooted in revolutionary nonviolence. And he was right. And the authors of this wonderful book, uh, it's a short book um, and it's very accessible, uh, Progressive Except for Palestine, epitomize, you know, in my mind, what it means to bring an international lens to justice struggles and um, what it means to contribute to and to build movements without borders. Um, so there's lots of questions I wanna ask <laughs> to get this conversation started and so much that I wanna explore, but I do wanna um, you know, make sure that we have time for questions from folks who are listening too. Um, and I also wanna make sure that this conversation is really accessible to people who are kind of new to this conversation because I remember what it felt like when I was just getting started and I would often feel intimidated by my lack of knowledge regarding the complex history and wondering if I could really wade in or have a firm view without a tremendous amount of deep study. Um, so I would love to start with you, Mark, and just ask you kind of why, um, why Palestine? Um, when did you first become interested in Palestine and the plight of the Palestinian people? And then why did you write the book? Well, first of all, thank you for, thank you to Politics and Prose for inviting us. Uh, I, this is my first Politics and Prose event. This is my, my sixth book. Um, and uh, I never had the opportunity to do this before. As a bookstore owner myself, I'm, I'm sort of, I, I have deep admiration for what it takes to do this kind of work. And politics and prose is just a wonderful place to be. And, I, and I'm, 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 as the nerd in me is literally geeked to be here doing an event. Um, and, and Michelle, I, I am so grateful that you were able to say yes. Um, I've admired your work for a long time. Um, I, I, I've appreciated the time we've been able to spend together uh, on panels. Um, your book is something that I read and teach widely. And I'm, I'm just, have extraordinary gratitude that you took the time to read our book, take it seriously, and be willing to be in dialogue uh, with us. We started the week with an event with uh, Angela Davis, and now we get to end the week uh, with Michelle Alexander. I, 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 I don't deserve all these blessings. Mitchell probably does. I, I, I don't. So 
Um, so, so just thank you. Um, the, the idea of Palestine for me, you know, I, I grew up as an activist and I was always um, interested in leaving the world better than I found it since my teens. Uh, when it was local, it was trying to end, I was sort of too young for the South Africa movement, but I was aware of people who had, who had, who had done that work. But I was I was interested in fighting police brutality. I was interested. I was out beaten. We're like, what do we do? Where do we go? How do we stop this? So it's not just getting justice for Rodney King, but trying to set of circumstances that allow that to happen and be normalized. Uh, it was part of the work that we wanted to do. Um, I was on the ground trying to figure out how to stop mass incarceration, or all of these. Care deeply about. Then I found Malcolm X. And when I encountered Malcolm X and Martin King, both of them, what I found were people who were deeply committed to the, to the issue of justice. But what I also found was that these were two people who were profoundly committed to linking what was happening domestically to that which was happening internationally. Not just because there was a moral impulse to do so, that is to say, if somebody's being harmed in India or China or, or, or Colombia, I wanna be there to do something about it. But there's also an analytic there that says that the forces that cause oppression to people around the globe are interconnected. And that if we have any vision of freedom, any real vision of freedom, it has to be one that accounts for the internationalist perspective and as vulnerable folk, black folk, brown folk, poor folk, queer folk, um, trans folk. There's also a way that we have to have united fronts and coalitions of solidarity. And so that caused me to read deeply and widely. Um, when I was in my 20s, you know, we were, it, was, it was very much about stopping the Iraq war. Um, I was also interested in this question of slavery in Sudan uh, and Mauritania. I was very much um, trying to figure out how we could deal with these issues. When I went to graduate school, uh, my interest changed and I was interested in much, I was largely focused on North American issues and largely focused on issues around pop culture, et cetera. Um, but then the, 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 I, I, got the, I got the bug again and I started reading, um, Malcolm came back to me and, 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 he, and, and, and Angela Davis came back to me. And, 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 but I also started reading more widely again and, I, and I'd, al I'd always had an interest in the Middle East and, and specifically uh, around um, questions around what it meant to be black in the Middle East and what it meant to be uh, racialized in the Middle East, and so my so what I began to when I began to study the Middle East, it wasn't Palestine per se. It was around it was really much more around Sudan and Egypt. Um, I was also doing activist work and I was on TV, and so all this stuff was mixed together. And then when I was on the streets of Ferguson in 2014, um, we were. I was there as a journalist and I was there as an activist and I was there as a scholar writing. I had like three hats and I was, I was doing a bunch of different stuff, but there were nights where we got tear gas. There were nights where we, you know, were, were, were being brutalized. Um, and there was one night in particular where the tear gas had hit us pretty badly. I was actually with Kiki Palmer, um, the actress, real random um, in Ferguson. We were, we were, we were uh, hosting something for BET. And the tear gas came and it hit us and we couldn't breathe and we couldn't see and we barely got to our hotel rooms. Um, and when I, I looked on Twitter, uh, Mariam Barghouti, uh, a sister from the West Bank um, and others had tweeted to us from the West Bank. Um, they had been protesting all month because of, of the war in Gaza, Op Operation Protective Edge. And they said, look, we know tear gas. Uh, here's how you wash your eyes out. Here's how you protect yourself. Stand closer to the officers. They can't shoot the tear gas if it's going to come near them. And, and, and they knew, they, 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 they had an understanding of what we were dealing with because of that. And so that was the first moment where the questions around solidarity went from abstract to practical for me. I had read about SNCC. I had read about, you know, in 1967 at the minor. I had read about, Mal I had read Malcolm's uh, essay. I had read Angela Davis. But this was the first time where I saw something particular. And I heard people screaming, Ferguson to Palestine. That January, we made a trip there. I, I, I accompanied many people, um, activists, 
organizers, one of the founders of Black Lives Matter, Patrice Cullors, well, Carmen uh, uh, Perez, uh, you know, who works with uh, Harry Belafonte now, and, and so many people. And we went and we saw it, what Malcolm called engaged witness. And we saw on the ground what Vincent saw, may he rest in peace. We saw occupation, we saw violence, we saw inequality. And that spurred me to think about this issue in a, in a broader way. Um, still interested in the other issues, still committed to critiquing Saudi Arabia, still committed to critiquing Bahrain, still cr committed to critiquing all these other places. But I had a question about Palestine as a taxpayer, as an activist, and as someone who was connected to the, beginning to be connected to the communities there. So I continued to study, went back to graduate school, got a, a graduate degree in Middle East studies so that I could have this kind of deep history uh, and I'm just focusing specifically on Israel-Palestine so that I could focus on this issue um, so that I could focus and understand uh, the dynamics at play here. Um, and so for me, Palestine is not the only issue, um, but for me, it is a key issue as we talk about global solidarity and any vision of freedom. So why were you particularly motivated to write the book at this moment in time? And I'll be quick with this because I, I know Mitchell it, it has, has a, you know, a lot to say about this too. I, I think, um, Mitchell and I were, first of all, we we're trying to figure out how do we write a book on this? And, you know, I have more work on Palestine that will be coming out later. Uh, that, that's like my actual research on, you know, the Afro-Palestinian community in Jerusalem. And I, you know, and I have a film that looks at, you know, some other communities there, but, but I wanted to speak to the policy question because um, I'm not Palestinian, I'm not Israeli. Mitchell is neither Israeli nor Palestinian. And so we felt like some of the decisions that need to be made in the region, the ultimate decisions, the final status questions, all these things should probably be decided by the people in the region. But as Americans whose tax dollars fund much of the institutional arrangements and political uh, or policy decisions that are made, we felt like we needed to say something to Americans. And what better moment than right now, as we were at the most extreme type of, of fascism with Trump, mm -hmm. right? And we were watching extraordinary changes happening. Yeah. Um, changes that could allow someone to believe that, there's a, that, that Trump is the boogeyman and that he's the only problem when it comes to Middle East policy. Trump was a problem. Um, but he wasn't out of step in many ways with, with US policies we talked about in the book. But also this is a moment filled with possibility. Mm -hmm. We now, as we enter into a democratic presidency, we have an opportunity to ask a question of, is this, is this commitment to justice real? Um, is, 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 the, is, the, is, the, is the support for policies that have harmed Palestinians bipartisan? Do we have an opportunity right now to no longer be peps, as we call them in the activist community, people who are progressive except for Palestine? Mm -hmm. um, this is the context. Uh, and so I think any time is a great time to write about this issue, yeah. but I couldn't any longer not contribute to the conversation given what I've seen, given what I've learned, and given this extraordinary relationship I have with Mitchell, uh, who is brilliant and insightful and also has a passion for justice. And I said, and other than being a Brooklyn Nets fan, he's quite wise. And I said, we need to do something together. He said, we need to do something together and we decided to do it. Great. Yeah, Mitchell, I'm, I'm curious to hear from you about the why, you know, um, I know that you have a, you bring a Jewish perspective and a Jewish lens um, to the issue. And I'm curious about why, why have you taken this up as uh, you know, kind of a cause for which you have devoted your time and written this book. So, um, first of all, let me also, you know, let me echo what, what Mark said. Um, I'm just, I'm really thankful of, uh, to you for being here with us. I'm a big fan. I'd love your book. Your essay on Martin Luther King Day was a game changer, frankly. It was a really big deal. And so, you know, I'm so honored that you decided to do this and um, it, it, it just caps off, as Mark said, a great week. Um, to, I mean, to, to deal with the question, I mean, I actually was one of these people that that is in the title of the book. I was a progressive except for Palestine uh, in my, especially in my teen years, I was very active. I'm, I'm a bit older than Mark. So I was active in the anti-apartheid movement. I was active on a whole range of issues, Cuba, Central America, uh, in those days, the, you know, this is like in the Reagan year. So, uh, you know, Nicaragua was a big deal. El Salvador was a big deal. Um, and I was doing a lot of this work. And I really did believe that Israel was, a di was different. It was exceptional. There were these issues. Um, for one thing, in the 80s especially, it was easier, much easier to avoid them. 
you know, in, in the United States. We, you know, we didn't have much reporting. Uh, the first Intifada was a game changer as far as that goes. Uh, it was the first time that, that I as an American and many Americans were really exposed to the humanity of Palestinians, to the, to the situation of the occupation. And incidentally, the occupation was much less harsh back then than it is today. Um, but uh, so <clears throat> over a great many years, actually, from uh, up until pretty much the end of the century, uh, I was studying and learning and finding out more and, and finally going over there and seeing what was going on. And actually, you know, it was one of the more surreal things to me was how uh, how many people said, well, you, you went to the to the West Bank and you went to Gaza. Uh, how could you do that? Did they know you were Jewish? And the answer was, yeah, I know you, they knew people knew I was Jewish. Um, I was completely welcomed. Nobody grilled me and interviewed me about, you know, what does it mean that I'm Jewish? It was just, okay, you're Jewish. Then here is some coffee. Here is some food. You have to eat it. It doesn't, <laughs> you know, we will be insulted if you don't. Um, and just really warm and welcoming. And frankly, as I, you know, as I told people, I have felt much more threatened uh, on the streets of New York, which is where I was living at the time, uh, than I did in the West Bank um, and, and in Gaza. Uh, so, you know, there were many of these experiences that, that sort of turned me around. And um, by the end of the 20th century, I had joined up with Jewish Voice for Peace and um, started, that was when I really got active uh, on this issue. And I've been at it ever since. It is, it's important to me personally um, as, as a Jew, it, it is important, but it's also, I think much more for me, it's, it's really about, uh, this issue is a place where I, I feel more as an American than I do as a Jew, frankly, uh, because we have a lot of responsibility for what's going on there. And yet for the most part, we feel like that's an over there thing. You know, it's, 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 you know, even people who may not necessarily be support, very supportive of Israeli policy still say, well, you know, they've been fighting for hundreds of years, which is not true, um, that, that it's an insoluble conflict, that it, they're, they're religious fanatics, what, you know, lots of different ways in which we disassociate the fact that the United States is a key driver of everything that's happening there of all of the insecurity and of the ongoing occupation. Israel cannot, uh, cannot occupy uh, uh, Palestine without the US support, not just in terms of the military, not just in terms, but, but diplomatically. We, what we, the way we shield Israel from any and all consequences of their policies is unique in history as far as I know. So, um, so this may, you know, this, this is what motivates me, I think, more than anything else, you know, in the, in all of the activism I've ever done. Um, well, I should not say that it's not true that in all of the activism I've ever done, I've done it from a place of privilege. There have been a few ways in which there are some ways in which uh, uh, I have not acted, but most of the activism I've done, um, anti-racism work, anti-sexism work, um, and, and, and certainly on this issue, uh, anything that has to do with U.S. foreign policy, I've always done it from a place of privilege. And I think that's really important for me. Um, and it's hard. And, you know, it, it is hard because you have to always look at your own privilege and you have to look at how you're reinforcing it. But if I want to live in a world, you know, I, I don't get to not have male privilege. I don't get to not have white privilege. Um, that isn't a choice. I have it, whether I want it or not, whether I would take it or not. And um, and the only way I can see, you know, to build a world where that isn't there uh, is to is to be active and to use that privilege in these uh, in these sorts of realms. And I, I think that um, both because of my interest and to some extent because of my identity, that also helped drive drive me towards this particular issue. And it also, I think, helped inform when Mark and I were trying to figure out exactly what to write about. Um, this, this sense that, uh, that we're not, that, that Americans are really not living their values uh, when they either support or ignore the occupation, when they either support or ignore the decade upon decade of dispossession of Palestinians, the, the fact that millions of Palestinians have lived their entire lives without any rights from birth to death, have lived uh, with no civil rights, without their human rights being respected, um, that is appalling. 
and it shouldn't be. And and we are in fact responsible for that. So that uh, to me was sort of the place that that uh, that that is a wedge point. And I think it was also partially the timing, because Israel has made their own tactical decision to sort of embrace the American right and the Republican Party. And they've abandoned, at least for the moment, I mean, they're trying to sort of recalibrate it now, but they, uh, over the last five or six years, they've really abandoned the traditional, their traditional strategy of bipartisanship in terms of activism here. And I was frustrated by the fact that I didn't see the, you know, the Democrats who were being spit on uh, reacting to this. It was, no, no, wait, please love us. Please still, you know, we're, we're just as pro-Israel as everyone else. And uh, even though the grassroots of the party was recognizing what was going on more and more. And, and so I thought it was really important for us to stimulate that conversation, hold up a mirror to American liberals and say, you know, this is what you're doing. The, this, this imbalance is here. You say that you hold these values, but you ignore them when it comes to Palestine. And that's intolerable. So that was how we ended up, I think, on, on this particular book. Yeah, one of the themes that runs throughout the book is, you know, that there is this profound double standard that exists, um, you know, among liberals and many progressives. Um, and, you know, the there's examples pointed out, you know, from the Trump administration just recently, you know, when Trump suggested that U.S. troops respond with live fire uh, against anyone from the Central American caravan as it approached, you know, they were... He was urging U.S. troops to fire on, um, you know, the Central American caravan if they dared to even throw rocks. Um, and progressives were outraged by this. And yet, you know, you write that um, there has been little um, outrage when Israel has responded to Palestinians um, with live ammunition as well as rubber bullets. But you know, it's interesting, and I see it even in the Q and A here. Um, there are those who say, "No, it's really you know Israel that's subjected to this double standard. Um, why uh, does the left always criticize Israel but not criticize Hamas and the Palestinian Authority? And um, why is you know Israel? Um, how can you say that Israel is genuinely?" Uh, shielded from criticism of their policies when they're constantly sanctioned by the UN. And so I'm curious if you could kind of just flesh out more how you see this double standard kind of operating um, among progressives, um, why <laughs> it exists um, to the extent that it does, and how you respond to you know, critics um, who say, well, actually, it's Israel that's being subjected to an unusually high standard and that not enough attention has been paid to um, the behavior of Hamas or um, the Palestinian Authority. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great question. There's so much to it. I'll, I'll, I'll maybe take part of it and Mitchell will take the other part. Uh, I'll, give, I'll leave Mitchell all the, all the difficult parts. Um, I, uh, I, I think that, uh, first of all, on the left, I think what we see is a kind of sometimes a silence on issues uh, that happen to the Palestinian people. Some of that silence is not born out of cowardice. Some of it is born out of people just not knowing. It's very difficult uh, if you watch a, a, a cable news cycle, which most of us is how we get our news these days or, or, or Twitter, right? Um, you know, for every 10 stories we hear about the US, we hear maybe one uh, international story. And then among those international stories, you, you, you got North Korea, you got Russia, you got, you know, there's a list of things that come up. And so it, it, some of it is about not having access to these stories, right? Some of it is the kind of Orientalist vision of, of, of brown people, uh, of Muslims, of South Asians, of Arabs, that kind of says, as Mitchell alluded to earlier, well, those people are always fighting. This is an intractable problem. And so when you, in the same way that when, when we hear the death toll in Chicago, some people aren't nearly as outraged as when we hear uh, about the, uh, uh, someone dying in, in Nutria, Illinois, or, or, you know what I mean, or, or, or Gross Point, Michigan, um, because there's a sense in some way that the, the, the lives in Chicago aren't worth as much as those lives in, um, in, in, in Nutria. You know, I, 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 I'll, sometimes you'll see a, a tragedy happen, like a school shooting, and people say, this shouldn't happen here. And of course it shouldn't happen here, right? There's nothing more awful than watching those babies harmed. 
but it shouldn't happen anywhere. Mm -hmm. But because of how we're taught to think about things, we often assign different value, even tacitly, even implicitly to certain people as opposed to others. And so I think that also plays into how we, how we think and talk about this. Um, and as a way of a concrete example, you mentioned uh, Donald Trump talks about the, the, the migrant caravans coming up from the southern border. He talks about how this is an assault on American democracy. He talks about how dangerous this is. Uh, he says that there are, some are rapists and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and thugs. And, you know, when Mexicans send people up, they don't send their best people. I guess we reciprocated yesterday by sending Ted Cruz down. You know, all of this is part of the conversation. But that same summer, that same summer, Donald Trump cut funds for the United Nations Relief Works Agency. For those that don't know, UNRWA is the primary agency um, that provides healthcare, housing, education, food to Palestinians in the West Bank, and particularly those who have, those in the West Bank and, and also those who have um, refugee status. And there are many Palestinians who live in refugee camps, these aren't temporary camps. If you're, uh, you know, if, if you're in a place like um, uh, like Kalandia, not Kalandia, if you're in a place like like Tulkarim, for example, they've been there since since 1948. They came from Wadi Khawarat and, and moved there in 1948. So these are people who've been there for decades, and they need these things to live. And Donald Trump cut it. It, it was it was a profound act of cruelty. And so if we're outraged at children in cages or, or family separations at the border, which the left was very vocal about, then we have to be equally outraged at this. And this one didn't even cost us as much because no one, this wasn't like there was a, ref, a wave of, of Palestinian internally displaced refugees trying to come to the States. This was merely about saying, this is wrong. But oftentimes we don't do that for all of those, for all of those reasons. And, and you know, it, it's important because there's often a subtext to these conversations. Um, it's important that we take that subtext and bring it up. The, the reason why we don't talk about it, let me say what it is not. It is not because of some Jewish conspiracy. It, it is not because of some cabal of power. Those, those are the kind of anti-Semitic conspiracy theories that not only do harm to Jewish people, but also compromise our ability to have a proper analysis of what's actually happening, right? We have to look at political lobbies. We have to look at, at, at the United States' Uh, uh, strategic interest in the Middle East. The United States, since since post World War II, has had a concrete uh, material interest in controlling the Middle East, following the British and, and the French to a lesser degree, and 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 so having a colonial outpost or having an, any outpost in, in in the Middle East is valuable to them. And so this is about politics. This is about power. Um, it, this is about an, an array of things. And because politicians play it safe. Politicians get elected to get reelected. If you were to walk and if you were to look at the 2016 debates and listen to Hillary Clinton's speech and Donald Trump's speech, they, they couldn't be more opposite. If you were to listen to Bill Clinton and uh, and uh, Dole or 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 or, uh, or 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 George Bush and uh, and and John Kerry, um, they would, couldn't all be more different until this issue comes up, and then their speeches look the same. Because it's much safer to say we stand with Israel, uh, to not have much to say about the Palestinians, um, and to not shake the boat. It's the same thing we've done on guns for a long time. We did it on gay marriage. We did it on legalization of drugs. These issues can change, but it's up to us to challenge uh, the, the status quo, to make those things change. And the idea that Israel uh, is, is, is under extraordinary scrutiny, if you look at, just give one quick example, if you look at the International Criminal Court, the ICC, who's, who, who's, who's been found guilty in the, in the ICC? It's not the United States for Afghanistan. It's not China. Now, in fairness, China is not, has, did not accede to the, uh, the Rome Statute, i.e. They're, they're, they're actually not, um, it's not within their jurisdiction, but they wouldn't be anyway, right? But you got Uganda, so, you know, we, Libya, Sudan. It's not a coincidence. It's African nations that often get dinged by the ICC, and powerful nations don't. It's not to say, again, including it's not just Israel that gets accepted from this, but it's one of them because powerful nations often are able to avoid this. Yes, the UN makes resolutions, but the the but but the UN makes resolutions against settlement expansion, but the US vetoes them. The most courageous act the U.S. did was when Obama was in office and all he did was abstain. And so when these things are happening, 
Um, it's part of it is that yes, Israel sometimes gets pointed to, but often th there's no material consequence because settlement expansion hasn't really stopped, right? And, and, and anyway, I don't want to keep going, but, but but I think these are some of the main main issues why. Yeah, so you know, I'd love to hear too from Mitchell about what you see is at stake, um, particularly for Jews in this debate. You know, underlying a lot of the these arguments that I have heard when I've been in debates is kind of this fear of um, Israel no longer existing anymore. You know, you hear you're arguing against the right of Israel to exist as a nation, or you're questioning Zionism. That it, for many people, um, I think any argument in favor of greater Palestinian rights is interpreted as an attack on the right of Israel to exist or an attack on Zionism or an attack on Jewish people themselves. And in the Q&A, um, there's a question here around how can we uh, you know, explain the injustices of what's happening in Palestine without evoking anti-Semitism or being perceived as being anti Semitic. And so I'm curious how you respond to that um, and, uh, you know, how we kind of get out of that kind of catch 22 and find a pathway to be able to talk about the human rights crisis there without it being framed in uh, as anti Semitic or as an attack on Israel's right to exist. So I think there's a few, I mean, there's, there's actually a lot packed in there, right? Um, you know, when we're talking about, uh, I mean, first of all, look, everybody who uh, talks about Palestinian rights gets accused of being anti-Semitic, everyone. Uh, from the most, you know, radical to the most moderate, everyone everyone has has experienced that, including, very much including Jews. I get called an anti-Semite all the time, uh, even though I have been personally, physically assaulted uh, because I'm Jewish, um, as have family members of mine, but... Um, but that you no, know, none of that shields me. I get the same criticism everyone else does. Um, so part of it is also that some of these attacks are disingenuous. Some of these attacks are cynical uses of uh, accusations of anti-Semitism to silence criticism of Israel. And I think it's really, really important for us to separate those things. Having said that, you know, there are also um, I think people who legitimately feel um, attacked as Jews, when Israel is criticized, because for American Jews who are largely secular, um, who who um, many of whom have no religious affiliation to anything, to Judaism or anything else, um, many American Jews, their Jewish identity is wrapped up in Israel. That is that's how they that's how they express their Jewish identity. That's how they feel their Jewish identity. And so when Israel is criticized, even if it's legitimate criticism, they feel it viscerally as an attack. And I think we need to I, I do think we need to ha try and hold in our hearts some sympathy for that response at the same time as we don't let it stop us from uh, treating Israel like a country like any other and criticizing those uh, those attacks. And, you know, also, you know, this question of attacking Zionism. Uh, Zionism is a political ideology and it is legitimate uh, to disagree with it and to think it is wrong. It is fine to do that. And that is a legitimate political debate. Now, obviously, you know, especially, and, and it's ironic because right now, many of the attacks on Zionism are characterized as anti-Semitic when, uh, when they're coming from a pro-Palestinian point of view. The truth of the matter is that, that the people who use Zionist as a proxy uh, for Jew so that they can get away with anti-Semitism and say, no, 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 I'm just criticizing Zionism or Israel. Most of that's on the right, not all. I mean, I'm not saying that it's the only place it happens. It, I have, I having personally encountered it on the left, I having personally encountered it in the Palestine Solidarity Movement, but in small, much, much smaller amounts than it exists on the right. And it basically comes from the place it always comes from, which is white supremacists. That is where most of that um, is happening. So how do we, how do we deal with that? How do we approach it? Um, I, I think the, there's only one way. And that is to be honest about it and to to absolutely stand against anti-Semitism. I think, you know, there is a legitimate issue that some progressive Jews, uh, both Zionist and anti-Zionist and in the middle and, where, you know, whatever their relationship to Israel have raised, which is that um, 
in progressive movements, sometimes anti-Semitism is not taken seriously. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, you know, there are reasons for that. There was a period where anti-Semitism was at a much, you know, historically low level in the United States, although it always still existed. It was always still a problem, but it was certainly at a lower level than it is, especially right now. It has, it has really spiked in the last few years and it's scary um, and it's dangerous. And, you know, people are being attacked and assaulted and, uh, and, and otherwise discriminated against. It's a problem. And I think the left needs to be conscious of its own uh, uh, sometimes indifference. And because uh, Israel-Palestine gets wrapped up in this question, it, it makes it very, very difficult to, to, to disentangle it. So, uh, so the only way is through integrity. So we stand against anti-Semitism as we stand against racism, Islamophobia, homophobia, misogyny, all of the things that, that progressives um, stand against. We stand against anti-Semitism wherever we see it as well. But we also you know, are, are very conscious and we have to be deliberate about saying Zionism is not Judaism. Right. It, it, it grows out, it grew out of Judaism in a sense, but it's, it's most passionate adherents have often have always actually included uh, Christian conservatives, uh, evangelicals, uh, end times uh, believers um, who, who actually are themselves anti-Semitic. You can find, I have encountered plenty of anti-Semitism in the pro-Israel world I have encountered some anti-Semitism in the pro-Palestinian world. Um, you can you can find it, and and neither one invalidates the other. Whatever people, if people are really dedicated anti-Zionists, the fact that there are anti-Semites among Zionists doesn't invalidate that. Doesn't invalidate Zionism. You, there's other reasons you might inval invalidate Zionism there, or Israeli policy or however, um, however you look at this. Um, and so I would go back. And just say, for the most part, uh, if we if we approach the question with integrity, if we approach the question with by by from a place of equality, I mean, I think fundamentally that's what drives me. I think that's what's at the heart of our book. What we are arguing for more than anything else is equal rights. That Palestinians and uh, and Israeli Jews should have equal rights that those should be respected equally, their humanity should be respected equally. I mean, and of course, as an abstract idea, many people can agree with that. Of course, the devil's in the details. How do you implement it and how you do that? And that's what politics is about. But right now, we don't, um, we don't have a way to speak about that without being assaulted with anti-Semitism. So to some extent, we have to take it. We have to support one another and say, you know, I see this all the time. Mark, you know, Mark has gotten all sorts of attacks. He's regularly called an anti-Semite in, in social media. He's much more present there. So I see a lot more of it directed at him than at me. And, you know, people need to defend him. And people need to defend me when I'm attacked. People need to defend you when you're attacked. People need to defend all of the all of you folks out there, when you're called an anti-Semite and you're not anti-Semitic, your friends and and comrades need to defend you. We need to. I think we need to be better about that and the progressive movements in general, in all sorts of different ways, about supporting one another. Um, but uh, so that that's one part of it. The other part is to to hold to the values that we are trying to defend. Uh, ultimately, if we know that we are not talking about disempowering Jews, we are not talking about harming Jews, we are not talking about anything other than opposing Jewish uh, 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 ethnocentric rule over Palestinians. Jewish power, you know, the, ultimately this conflict is not about Jews and Palestinians living together. It's about one side having power over the other. And the fears that you mentioned, Michelle, are, are rooted in the idea that uh, if, if, if Palestinians should be the majority in a, in a completely democratic uh, environment, that they will deprive Jews of their rights. That's where a lot, you know, and we have those same, that's very, it should be very familiar. That is the same white fear that we have here in the United States. And, you know, if we all work together to justice, for justice, that, that fear is not going to materialize. Um, Jews, so uh, Jews they... Muslims and Christians have lived together in that space before. It hasn't yeah. always been smooth, but it has uh, also hasn't been anything like what Jews have experienced, like in Europe, for example. Yeah. 
you know, one of the, the, the really valuable aspects of this book is the way it, in an accessible and concise way, um, walks the reader through much of the complex history and uh, explains uh, kind of how these debates about Israel's right to exist, um, you know, evolved um, over time. And at one point, I believe you say that really at its core, uh, this isn't a debate about whether a nation state should exist. This is a debate about whether Israel should have the ability to exist as a Jewish state, which requires the restrictions and limitations um, on non-Jews. And um, one of the questions here in the Q&A relates to the right to exist chapter. Um, and it says there in the chapter, the right of Israelis and Jews throughout the world to live in peace, safety, dignity, and self-determination is absolute and unquestionable. Um, and so there's a distinction in the book that's made between, of course, the right for Jewish people um, to be able to live in peace, safety, and dignity, and whether a nation um, that is discriminatory and oppressive has a right to exist in that form. Um, what do you imagine Israel would look like um, and how, uh, how, like, what do you envision as a democratic state for Israel that does not include um, the discrimination and current oppression um, of Palestinians? Yeah, it's a great question. And there's a way, so, so let, me, let me back up and back into that because I, I think the, the first thing is this question of the right to exist. You know, because even the language of the right to exist boxes Palestinians in in a very particular way. And it becomes almost a trick question. Do you believe in Israel's right to exist? On its face, it seems like a reasonable question. And the first impulse is to say, of course I do, right? Because what we're really thinking is, do we think Israelis have a right to exist? Do we think that the people who live there should be, have peace and safety and dignity uh, and self-determination and freedom? And I would say, sure, everyone does. But nation states do not have a right to exist. People do. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's the first thing. Nation states have a right to having their sovereignty respected, their territorial in in integrity respected, their borders uh, respected, etc. Israel deserves that like all states do. So that, that, that's, not, that, that's not what's in question here. But the idea of saying that Israel has a, that like, first of all, that demand is only made of Palestinians, right? No one is demanding that Americans or Canadians or Chadians or Bahrainians are, are demanding or are affirming Israel's right to exist. That's a demand only made from the people whose lives are most compromised by the existence of the state. And so the language itself is used, it's also used as a moving target, right? As, as in, whenever um, in, in, whenever the, the, the conversation about coming up with a deal came up, it, the, the, the moving target was, well, but the, if the Palestinians just won't acknowledge Israel's right to exist, right? And then it was, well, they want, or, or they want to recognize its right to exist as a Jewish state. Um, multiple occasions in the 70s, um, in the 80s, certainly 1988, by the time you get to 1988, they've recognized UN Resolution 242, uh, UN resolution, which comes which comes in 1967 after the after the 1967 war, 338 after after uh, the, the the October War, 1973, uh, uh, Yasser Arafat made a public declaration, and then he gave a press conference the next day and said, "If you still don't think I'm sure, I'm saying I believe in the existence of two states." Right? Um, he 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 did all the things before the Oslo Accords of 1993. They wrote letters of mutual recognition. Yasser Arafat very clearly made his recognition of Israel. Whereas um, uh, all, all the state of Israel really did was acknowledge the PLO's right to represent them. My point is, is that there's never been a shortage of, of Palestinians who are recognizing that Israel exists, right? And that's not what's at stake here. Asking to recognize that, a, that, that, that Israel exists as it does right now is asking Palestinians to, to accede to, its, to their own oppression. So when, so when we made the distinction, we're saying, well, of course, people who live in Israel, Israelis, uh, have a right to live in peace, safety, dignity, self-determination, but it may look different in the final status of a peace agreement. It may look different in the final status of a conversation about justice. And so yeah, it, it's, it's about human rights. Mitchell's right. It's about human rights, but it's also about justice. And, because, and when we talk about justice, that means that power dynamics have to be accounted for. 
Uh, relations of history have to be accounted for. Trying to figure out how to right wrongs have to be accounted for. And we have to figure out how to do that while we create a lasting and, and determining peace. And so rather than demanding that, that, that Palestinians affirm that Israel has the right to exist as it does right now, right, which, which is as a state that is that is dispossessed them, that oppresses them, and that continues to marginalize them, we should instead be asking for a, a vision of justice that allows everyone to to live together in a land, but for but for one group to relinquish, I'm quoting Nora Adekat here, for one group to relinquish itself of the right of the desire to rule, right? So it will look different. If we create justice in America, white folk, yeah, they are going to lose a little bit. If we had racial justice, some white folk will be uncomfortable. Right? If we had economic justice, some rich folk will be uncomfortable. So we have to create that. That does not mean though that we do not recognize the legitimate reasons that Jewish people are scared. It does not mean that we don't recognize the rising tide of anti-Semitism around the globe. It does not mean that we don't have a moral obligation to make sure that Jewish people are, are protected, not just in the state of Israel, but around the globe. But that protection can't come at the expense of Palestinians. And it can't be a pretext for denying Palestinians their right to their homeland as well. And that for me is the key. So I don't have, I mean, I'm a one stater. I'll be honest about it. I believe in a singular democratic um, secular state, one person, one vote, where everybody has access to it. To me, that's the only thing that's fair. As long as you have a state that is not a, 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 a state of all of its citizens, you're going to have inequality. You can't have a 17 and a half percent population of Palestinians living inside of Israel. You can't have millions more living in the West Bank and Gaza and in exile and say that it's that, that the current arrangement is fair or just. No, we need an arrangement that includes everybody and that accounts for the rights of Palestinians. We need a new thing. Ultimately, though, Michelle, that ain't up to me. Ultimately, Palestinians and Israelis have to come up with something that works for them. I believe in one state. I believe the two-state solution is gone. I believe the two-state solution. I don't believe in, in religion. I don't believe in religious states. I don't believe in Islamic states. I don't believe in Jewish states. I don't believe in Christian states. I believe in democratic secular states. That's my that's my personal philosophy. But ultimately, we need an end game that works for everybody. And I think the stakeholders there have to make that decision. That's why we didn't write a book about one versus two states or any of those things. We wrote a book about what Americans can do um, to think, particularly on the, on, the, on the left, to think about our politics differently and our choices differently and our activism differently so that we can create a, a space of justice for everybody. Just really, I, can, okay. I just really want to add something to what Mark just said that I think is really important. I think one of the issues that 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 keeps coming up, and it's not only in in regards to Palestine, it's in regards to all sorts of social justice issues, and that is, well, how do you know it, it can't be perfect? How do how, but and yet you're demanded, you know, to say how everything is going to be happy in the end. Politics doesn't stop. Okay, the the if if we can end the occupation of Palestine, for example. Um, and we can actually address the situation of Palestinians within Israel. Hey, that's that's all terrific. That's all great. But there are serious problems that that we all will have to deal with. Um, you know, I think one right now uh, you look at you know, people put together this this idea about Palestinian autonomy, set up a Palestinian authority. That that Palestinian authority has been a human rights abuser. It's been corrupt. It's 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 laced with cronyism. You have uh, the Hamas authority in in Gaza that uh, that is also a human rights abuser. I mean, there's a lot less sort of grift and graft because there's just less so much less money. But um, but um, the, the human rights abuses are very serious and very real. Anybody can see uh, from Palestinian uh, uh, human rights groups, the Palestinian human rights monitoring group, al Haq, uh, many groups in the West Bank and Gaza, we don't hear about it much here. You have to actually go and, and seek out their information, but it's there and Palestinians are screaming about it, just we're not hearing it. So there will, you know, the, I can talk about a vision um, but my vision doesn't matter because I'm not Israeli and I'm not Palestinian. Um, but uh, even Israelis and Palestinians could talk about a vision, and that's terrific. You know, we talk about a vision here in the United States, but we are a long, long way from that. What what needs to happen is we need to get better, and we need. And I think as outsiders, the our role um, as Americans is, you know, I'm, I'm stepping back to what I keep coming back to, which is to advocate for equal rights, for justice, as Mark put it, and um, and. And for a the universal and uniform application of those principles to Israelis and Palestinians, 
That's our role. And we have done a terrible, terrible job at it. And that, and, and I, you know, can we do that perfectly? I have no idea. We can certainly do it better than we are now. So we only have a couple of minutes and I want to just thank you both. This has been such a fantastic dialogue and I am really urge everyone to read the book and dive in because it contains a lot of history and um, answers. Um, many of the questions we haven't been able to get to um, in, in some real thoughtful detail. But before we close, I wonder if you know each one of you could just spend a minute saying something about what uh, you hope for from progressives and perhaps from the Biden administration, um, you know, in the months and years to come, um, you know, obviously getting rid of Trump uh, does not in any way solve the problem um, that we face in Palestine or here. And so, you know, looking forward, what is, um, you know, what do you hope for and what would you ask of, you um, um, progressives in this moment. Mitchell, you, I, I, I'll go and give Mitchell the last word. I, I, I think that I want progressives to become more aware of this issue. That's why we wrote this book. Hopefully that, that conversation can get bigger and broader. I want, uh, I want uh, progressives, leftists, whatever, however they self-identify to be committed to holding those in power accountable on this question. Um, I want them to no longer make Trump the boogeyman. Trump moves the embassy to Jerusalem, from Jerusalem, moves the, the American embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, yes. But the Jerusalem Embassy Act started in 1995. Every, every president has signed a waiver on it. Democrats and Republicans have kicked this down the field, meaning that we can't allow Trump's sort of exaggerated, bizarre sort of recklessness to be a distraction to the fact that there's been bipartisan consensus on the oppression of Palestinian people for many, many years. So I need us to hold the left accountable just as much to the right. This can't be the exception. The same way we need answers on jobs, the same way we need answers on justice, criminal justice, the same way we need answers on education, we need answers on Palestine. And we have to, we have to uh, challenge um, the, Ameri the American power structure to use its bully pulpit in the interest of justice. As I said, I think it's ultimately the final, the, the, the ultimate decision of what that looks like is up to the stakeholders. But as people in the United States, we can't allow that to work itself out because the United States has had a long history of weighing in in the Middle East. We've had a long history of affecting policy. So now, as Dr. King once said, because America has done something special against the Negro, it must now do something special for the Negro. We must now do something special for the region because we've had such an exploitative role in the region. And that means advocating not just for, for human rights, although I think that's right, but advocating for a vision of justice that allows the Palestinian people to have freedom, safety, dignity, and self-determination. Yeah, I think that I think that's exactly right. I think what's, you know, to me, I keep coming back to this idea about equal rights and equality and what our role as outsiders is. And and Mark nailed it. It it's um, there's a massive imbalance of power between Israel and the Palestinians. Israel mm -hmm. is a, a, a regional hegemon militarily. It's the most politically and economically stable country in the region. Um, it in and the Palestinians are a stateless people with frankly lousy leadership and you know and and internal squabbles and no power, no leverage whatsoever. Part of the role, a big part of the role of the international community is making sure that, yes, I do think Israelis and Palestinians have to work these things out the, for themselves, but they have to do so in an atmosphere of equality and only the international community can make that happen. Um, and that's by supporting and and uh, supporting uh, Palestinian, not taking the side of Palestinians, but supporting their right to have an equal say and setting up a forum for negotiations that that allows Palestinians to have an equal say to the Israelis. Um, I think that's the only way this gets resolved in whatever format. And I think that is really important. As far as the Biden administration, I, I'm just hoping that we survive it, frankly, as far as this issue goes. The Biden administration, the, everything about Biden, Biden ran on the whole idea of going back to pre-Trump, going back to the normal that was before. Well, the normal that was before on this issue was a disaster, and it is clearly where he wants to get back to. Um, he's, he's made that quite plain. He wants to get back to all the same sorts of things that we were doing before Trump. Um, so 
what I'm hoping during the Biden administration is that we survive it and that the forces within the Democratic Party that are that are gathering strength and getting much stronger, that support equal rights for everyone in that region, um, continue and start to really exert pressure. Because the one thing that is certainly true about Biden is that he is vulnerable to that pressure. So we can see some good coming out of that. Thank you. Thank you to both of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was an honor. It really was an honor. Uh, on behalf of Politics and Prose, I'd like to thank everyone who has tuned in for this wonderful event. And of course, uh, many thanks to our very esteemed guests. Um, this has been a very fruitful conversation. And um, we hope to hear more on this topic going forward. Uh, wish everyone well. Uh, stay well. Stay well. We're it. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye-bye.